welcome to Nuked Radio. This is episode 37. Today is Tuesday, June the 5th, 2012. I'm your host, Christina Consolo, and with me today is Jules. Hi, Christina. Hi. Happy Venus Transit Day. Yes, I'm actually excited. We have blue skies here, so I'm hoping that I can see it. Um, I believe they said 6 p.m. Eastern. Is that it? Yeah, I know uh, Australia won't be able to see it until tomorrow morning, but this is when Venus passes between Earth and the sun, and it's going to be starting for us before sunset. And again, because you're looking uh, at the sun, you have to have eye protection. You can't just look at it unaided, and I don't mean sunglasses either. You have to either have a solar scope, welder's glass, or I use a strip of color film to look at it. That's how we watch the, uh, or try to watch the eclipse. And, and you were just saying, too, we had a lunar eclipse the other night. I didn't know about that, and I saw people posting, why is there a shadow on the moon? I hadn't heard that we were supposed to have a lunar eclipse. And I knew this Venus transit was coming up, but it came up on us quick. Yeah, I didn't know about the lunar eclipse either, which was somewhat unusual because I tend to stay up on those things. But I caught a story after the fact with a few photographs. So it was kind of odd. Something else that's rather unusual is the solar wind storm that we're getting right now from a huge coronal hole on the sun. In fact, Dr. K. Uh, Strong from YouTube put out a video this morning talking about that. The wind stream from that was 700 miles per second when it's normally around 400. He said to expect aurora or northern lights. In fact, I put a link into chat for Ovation Prime, and it's on the Radchick page too. Then you can check it out and see how far south the northern lights may extend. And it's updated frequently if you... Uh, look at it throughout the day, you'll notice that that green band will change in relation to uh, what is coming at us from the sun. And of course, having all these things going on, the, the full moon, lunar eclipse, Venus transit, and the solar wind stream, you got to wonder about earthquakes. And I've noticed there hasn't been anything going on in Japan in the last few days. And we had talked about last week how the West Coast hasn't had anything either. Although they've had lots of earthquakes from Russia to Alaska and from the Philippines all the way around to Argentina and Mexico. And Japan had a couple big ones, but they were far north and far south on some of those intersecting plates. And last night, too, someone put out an alert. There was a buoy off of uh, Tokyo that started going off around midnight indicating there had been a sharp drop in the water level, but I didn't see any earthquakes. After that, Jules, you had mentioned you saw a couple of weird ones. I know that there were a lot going on in the Atlantic Ridge I this weekend, that. all the way from Puerto Rico, St. Martin, up to Greenland. Yeah, and that, that Mid-Atlantic Ridge, you know, that's been relatively stable for a long time. Um, over the last oh, maybe six months or so, there have been a few earthquakes in the five region, um, but it seems like lately there have been a lot more than normal through there. And what worries me is that we have the Canary Islands down off of uh, the coast on the other side. You know, and if you remember, that was like the original worry um, once we started having all this tectonic activity was that if that island ever slid into the Atlantic, uh, that would cause like this massive tsunami in their um, simulations that would hit the entire east coast of the U.S. Yeah, and then there's a huge nuke dump right off of yeah. El Hero also yeah. where we were dumping barrels of radioactive waste for years and years. And the so barrels are we don't all degrading. Know, right, and how, how that could possibly be disturbed from either earthquake or volcanic activity, but it looked like just on their own those barrels have uh, disintegrated. They expected them at those depths and for the material that they're made out of to last 50 years, and it's been 45 years since those barrels were dumped. So, um, yeah, pretty disturbing. If you ever run across a barrel in a deep waterway, stay away from it. Probably not a good thing, that's for sure. 
Well, we definitely need to watch Japan as far as the earthquakes go. And any of you who have been watching the TEPCO cameras have probably noticed that they are um, dismantling some of the upper floor on Reactor 4. And it is a good thing that they're doing that. They're making the structure lighter overall so it can withstand more seismic activity. And I wonder how much that spent fuel pool weighs in itself with the water, the rods, the materials that fell into it. You know what worries me about that, it, speaking specifically the weight, is that I saw a story the other day where uh, – one former worker came out from TEPCO and said that um, they had planned to spray concrete as like a last ditch effort if stuff went bad into the fuel pool. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> that's great, except how much more is that concrete going to weigh? You know what I mean? And they were talking about doing that if we lost water in yeah. the uh, pond. You know, not about if it fell over because then it's too late. But if we lost water in the pond, they were talking about maybe spraying concrete. So, and you know, it, it was interesting that they had that large concrete truck there. Remember, they brought that in a while mm -hmm. back, and they've been using it for water. But they could easily spray a large amount of concrete. But well, what would Arnie, that weight do? Yeah, Arnie Arnie Gunderson had said a few weeks ago too in one of his radio interviews he did that that pool will actually swing almost like a pendulum mm -hmm. during a large earthquake. I didn't know that. So, but for now, it's still there, and the good news is it hasn't fallen yet. Knock on wood. So, I did have an article I wanted to read. This is from HLN, published this morning, about the transit of Venus, because it is a somewhat of a rare event. Last chance to see hole in the sun for 105 years. Maybe you'll be here in 105 years. If so, good for you. However, for the rest of us, this Tuesday will present a chance to see something that will never happen again in our lifetime and possibly your children's. Although actually seeing it is going to require some extra protection. It's called the transit of Venus, an extremely rare astronomical event in which Venus passes between the Earth and the Sun at just the exact right angle so that the planet is silhouetted against the solar disk like someone punched a hole in the Sun. As the day goes on, the tiny black dot that's our solar system's second planet will traverse the sun in an arc, and it won't happen again until 2117. The transit of Venus occurs four times every 243 years. More than just an awesome spectacle, the transit of Venus also played a significant role in nothing less than helping determine the size of our solar system. During the pair of transit, transits which occurred in 1761 and 1769, scientists dispatched around the world to record the event from observatories and living room telescopes in locations including France, Austria, Tahiti, America, and Siberia. They each timed the duration of the transit from their vantage points to help calculate the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Turns out many of their observations were flawed due to a phenomenon called the black drop effect but the research laid the groundwork for learning the scale of the solar system. The full duration of Venus's trip across the sun is about six hours, and you can visit transitofvenus.nl to check your local viewing times. The same site also has some very handy advice on how to avoid destroying your retinas trying to see the thing. It's pretty long and detailed, though. So we'll have to just advise using a pinhole projector or creating a means to view a reflection of the event. So I'm definitely going to try to see that. It looks like we should have some good viewing from the Midwest if some of these clouds clear up. That was something I noticed when I did the forecast yesterday is, boy, we have a lot of rain going on right now. And we need to talk about some of the elevated radiation readings that have been found in various parts of the U.S. Right now we're going to take a break. And you are listening to Nuked Radio. You don't see that. And welcome back to Nuked Radio. This was published Sunday, June 3rd, 
in XSKF, a Japanese city to adopt animal behavior as an earthquake predictor, such as chickens squawking loud for no reason, probably a better predictor than the Japan Meteorological Agency, whose seismograph reportedly went over scale and couldn't issue an accurate measurement of the size of the March 11, 2011 earthquake in a timely manner and totally screwed up on the tsunami warning. The city, Susaki City, is located on the coastal area of Kochi Prefecture in Shikoku Island. And he quotes AFP via Yahoo Canada. Japan City could watch animals for tsunami signs. A Japanese city is considering introducing a tsunami warning system, which involves looking out for abnormal behavior in animals and monitoring water levels in wells for signs of an imminent disaster. They may not foretell a future disaster in a perfectly accurate manner, but the most important is to analyze such data thoroughly. Over the years, many tales about natural uh, happenings have been passed down as signs of an impending natural disaster in Japan, including abnormal movement of fish and cats fleeing their homes. There was a researcher named James Birkland who received some notoriety in the past for using lost pets as a precursor to earthquake activity. And I want to read just a little bit about this guy. He's a geologist who worked for the USGS from 1973 to 94. He's well known for his controversial earthquake prediction methods that include calculating the number of missing pet ads in the newspapers of earthquake-prone areas. His interest in geology began as a child, and he says his dad was a rock hound, after earning his B.A. in geology at UC Berkeley in 1958, he went directly to work for six years with the U.S. Geological Survey, involving laboratory and field work throughout the western United States, including Alaska. After earning his master's degree in '64, he accepted the position of engineering geologist with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation based in Sacramento, and for the next five years, worked on engineering projects involving the storage and moving of water at a number of dam sites, tunnels, and canals in California and Oregon. Let me see where it gets down to this research. He claims he can predict earthquakes with over 75% accuracy by calculating the number of lost pet ads in the newspaper and observing the lunar tide cycles. He's been meticulously saving and counting lost pet ads for many years and says the number of missing dogs and cats goes up significantly for as long as two weeks prior to an earthquake. He also noted many earthquakes occurred at the time of maximum tidal forces associated with the twice-monthly alignments of the sun and moon. In the 70s, he began to make informal predictions, scoring 6 out of 8 during 74, including the 5.2 Thanksgiving Day quake of November 27th. This one hit the day after he predicted it at a meeting of USGS geologists, and it shook him and his daughter while they were attending the movie Earthquake. Despite his successes in earthquake prediction, he found it almost impossible to publish on the subject in scientific journals. His career began to suffer, although his credentials, including fellowship in the Geological Geological Society of America and membership in the Association of Engineering Geologists, Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, American Association for the Advancement of Science, Sigma Science Honor Society, Peninsula Geological Society. I'm falling all over this article. Um, Basically using gravitational variations due to the lunar cycles, he's predicted these seismic windows. And every once in a while we hear from him. I don't recall what his last prediction was. But I'll drop this link into chat if you guys want to uh, check it out further. Um, National Geographic actually published on this too in November of 2003. Can animals sense earthquakes? And the interesting thing is in 2004, before the Indonesia quake and tsunami, that people saw animals heading for the mountains in droves. This article was actually published before that. This belief has actually been around for centuries. And it's something that you see continually brought up and then put down by researchers. But it makes sense just how they feel anything at all is a mystery. One theory is that wild and domestic creatures feel the earth vibrate before humans. 
Other ideas suggest they detect electrical changes in the air or gas released from the Earth. Earthquakes are sudden. Seismologists have no way of knowing exactly when or where the next one will hit. An estimated 500,000 detectable quakes occur in the world each year. Of those, 100,000 can be felt by humans, and 100 will cause damage. One of the world's most earthquake-prone countries is Japan, where devastation has taken countless lives and caused enormous damage to property. Researchers there have long studied animals in hopes of discovering what they hear or feel before the earth shakes in order to use that sense as a prediction tool. So we've been talking about this for a long time. And there was actually a city in China. Let me find it here. There's been examples where authorities have forecast, forecasted successfully a major earthquake based in part on the observation of the strange antics of animals. For example, in 1975, Chinese officials ordered the evacuation of Haicheng, a city with one million people, just days before a 7.3 magnitude quake. Only a small portion of the population was hurt or killed. If the city had not been evacuated, it is estimated that the number of fatalities and injuries could have exceeded 150,000. So it's very interesting research. And another thing that has been postulated as possibly an earthquake predictor is a large number of mammals like whales and dolphins that beach themselves prior to an earthquake. I did see in Fukushima Diary a few tens of tons of sardines washed up on a fishing port in Chiba. This was reported on June the 4th. But, of course, could that be from the radiation that's in the water there? Um, also interesting to know, there's a marine forecast tool where you can actually see where all of the boats are currently in the oceans. Someone brought this to my attention yesterday, and there was a number of fishing boats, Russian and Japanese, right off the coast of Fukushima yesterday, in addition to some cargo ships and so forth. But it's a, a real-time tool where you can see as they post their coordinates uh, where these ships are. Some of them will have, actually, pictures. I'll dig up that link and post it for you guys. Um, it's interesting to see there'd be any fishing at all off the coast, considering that the fish all the way on the other side of the Pacific are contaminated. And the story continues to make the rounds in mainstream, thank goodness. In fact, I have to say, Jules, I really feel kind of a sense of relief, almost, in seeing how much the mainstream has been picking up on some of these Fukushima articles. Oh, definitely. Recently, <laughs> I saw Gannett or Gannett, however you say it. I call them Gannett. The, um, the, I mean, they are nationwide uh, newspaper feed for stories, and they picked up on um, the spent fuel pool four story uh -huh. and about losing water and, you know, that it could kill millions, they said. But, hey, <laughs> even if they're underestimating, um, at least it's out there. I posted it on my personal Facebook page with a comment like, uh, for those of you who have told me that this isn't happening because, quote, you haven't seen it on the evening news, here you go. You know, yeah, we're, I mean, we're starting to see a number, a number of stories on the, the evening news, the tsunami debris, the radioactive tuna, spent fuel pool, and another thing is if another big earthquake happens, that's being reported quite a bit. And we're going to talk about that when we come back. You're listening to Nuked Radio. Welcome back to Nuked Radio. One thing that helps uh, promote some of the uh, mainstream discussion is when famous people, actors, actresses, or celebrities take on a cause. And just as Joe Rogan started tweeting about Fukushima, uh, there's an actor in Japan named Taro Yamamoto who is now all over the place talking about another big earthquake, 
We have to hurry up or else we will be too late. If another big earthquake happens, it will be the end of this country, but we will not let this happen. We will not let the nuclear plants be reopened. So he is trying to make this news go more mainstream. Largest U.S. newspaper publisher, enough radioactivity to poison millions in Fukushima Unit 4. Radiation to hit west coast of U.S. would be far more than trace amounts if fuel rods exposed, says Senator. Senator Wyden is still talking about his visit to Japan, although it's been six weeks, seven weeks since he issued his press release. Spent fuel rods containing enough radioactivity to poison millions remain in pools of water covered only in plastic in the badly damaged unit number four. If the building ever collapses, experts have warned the rods could become exposed and the radiation leakage would be unprecedented. And this appeared in Gannett Publishing. Another mainstream article, TV special on Fukushima. I honestly think for those who can run away from here, it is better to run away. This was a Fukushima fallout episode that appeared on Al Jazeera English. A volunteer and Mr. Yamashiro says, I honestly think that for those who can run away, it's better to. But for those who can't go anywhere, it's very important to help them. As much as possible. The Atlantic was also covering this. Is the government trying to contaminate every region of Japan by burning radioactive debris? If everyone is contaminated, then in a relative sense, no one is. This is something that Chris Busby brought up seven or eight months ago. Why are they trucking radioactive debris all over Japan to burn it? His theory was it would not show a significant increase just in people around Fukushima or Tokyo if the levels go up everywhere, that it would somehow protect TEPCO or protect them from having fingers pointed at them. Disposing by more than 20 million tons of rubble caused by the March 11th earthquake is proving to be a difficult problem for Japan not least because much of the rubble has been irradi irradiated by the Fukushima nuclear disaster. It is not clear why the Japanese government had, has decided against a policy of containing rather than dispersi dispersing the radioactive debris. Containment would also mean solidifying the already worrisome invisible border between contaminated and uncontaminated, uncontaminated areas with the former unfairly stigmatized. I have seen a few um, cities refuse to burn debris also. It's becoming a very important point of contention, as it should be. A local official in Japan also is reporting they found plutonium in every sample that they've tested. Radiation-absorbing bacterium is everywhere on paved surfaces. This was in a blog post from June 3rd by a city councilor. The other day when a member of the Diet visited Minamosima City, he said that he had a meeting with an official beforehand but got no information about it. What has happened to the Ministry of the Environment? This is an email that he sent. I sent you additional information about the black substance we talked about yesterday. There are bacterium type, which likes to absorb the radioactive substance in exuberance everywhere on the paved surfaces in the residential area and at residential houses, and it drifts on the sidewalks, on parking lots, and on the road. Cesium, for example, is highly radioactive, and yesterday I saw the results of analysis of Japan Chemical Analysis Center, which contained fluid. They found plutonium and strontium in every sample. And there's some information about the numbers. I'm going to um, post that for you guys to take a look at. Please send out SOS signals to the world. Level of bioconcentration of radioactivity have not been imagined or have been ignored daringly. Tried to tell officials many times and always denied. And this is from another city councilor who is making a map with a becquerel of algae types from the seaside of Japan, on the Pacific side, he's talking about biological concentrations and the environment. 
trying to get people to pay attention or at least answer to what they're going to do about it. And then we've got some more drama going on with Reactor 2 temperature gauges. Also being reported on XSKF, some terminal feelings at FUKU-1, where all they do is monitor the gauges more on temperature readings at Reactor 2. And I saw this morning that they do seem to be malfunctioning. You can look right at the TEPCO releases. They monitor the temperature not only in the reactor pressure vessels, but in the containment, in the air outside of the containment, and within the buildings, some of the temperature gauges for reactor 2 suppression chamber and the contain containment vessels seem to be malfunctioning. In each case, only one gauge out of several seems to be affected. Cause is unknown, according to TEPCO. Their countermeasure is closer monitoring. And I read somewhere, although it's not in this particular story, but in July, they are going to try to place some new monitors in unit two so we'll see if they have success with that now another thing that a few people were asking me about this weekend was a bomb threat near Sheridan Harris in the US which is in North Carolina apparently there was some kind of domestic situation going on in a car near the plant and when security went to investigate, the, there was a man and a woman that were seen arguing in a car. Um, they made a bomb threat. Authorities believe that it was a significant domestic incident and not related to the plant. No explosives were found. Um, the car was on a public road near the plant's entrance. And the two people were detained. One was arrested on an outstanding warrant. Of communicating threats and a plant spokesman said neither person was an employee of the, of the plant so um, there wasn't uh, a serious concern to that threat although I can certainly understand uh, why people in that area would be worried about it there were a few interesting things that happened with the radiation levels in the U.S. over the weekend, it appears that, Jules just checked again, that Radiation Network is up again and functioning properly. It seems that all the monitors are online. In fact, I noticed a couple new ones over the weekend that I hadn't seen before. I'm offline, and uh, I should probably get that machine back online because it looks like all around the East Coast the numbers are high. Where this, this uh, rain's been coming through, actually. Yeah, this this morning, too, when I looked at it, um, there were a couple uh, high numbers in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. uh, some fluctuations in Oregon. If you go to Radiation Watch on Facebook, too, you can look at graphs. What I, what I don't like about the Radiation Network is you're only seeing what's going on for that minute. Yeah, if you were on the network, I have all the graphs. Each individual gets a whole plot of what we read as well as we can go in and look at anybody else's charts. What I saw people commenting on is some, some of the pikes, spikes that they were noticing with their aggers and on the radiation network were definitely corresponding to the rain. However, Potter Blog picked up five times background in open air after a rainstorm that went through St. Louis yesterday. And they checked it out with uh, three different Geigers. So we'll have to watch the numbers in that area. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to Nuke Radio. And we are back. On last Thursday's show, we talked a little bit about this so-called zombie outbreak which seems to be centered in Florida. And then there's some flesh-eating bacteria cases along the East Coast. Uh, most of them are concentrated in Georgia. And there are some maps that have been started documenting where these cases are happening. And um, there is also some news coming out about these cases were actually starting to happen back in 2010. And some of the questions that people have had, is first of all, what does this do to you besides the obvious flesh-eating bacteria wounds, which often result in uh, a significant uh, lesion, surgery, excision, sometimes amputation? 
But these other cases that have been coming up is where the brain isn't working properly. People actually resort back to animalistic behaviors. One thing we had discussed in the past year, too, is how the rads could be affecting people in terms of behavior. And we also discussed the effect that radiation had on animals around Chernobyl. But we've never really had a case where such a large amount of people in so many populated areas have been exposed significantly over a long period of time. And, of course, it's only been a little over a year, and we're looking at this as being an ongoing event, even if things stay stable. So some of the questions that are coming up, are these cases related to the radiation or are they related to core exit? Or is it a possibility there's a combination of these two factors? So how does core exit behave out of a lab is another thing that people have been wondering about. And there was an article that was posted over the weekend. In fact, we have a physician on Orion who has a show, I believe it's on Saturday. Her name is Dr. Rebecca Carley. She's a former surgeon. Her show is called What's Ailing America? And she read um, this article, and it's something that she's very concerned about. And Jules, knowing her, said if Dr. Carley is concerned about it, I'm concerned about it. Um, Jules, do you ever get the feeling that we're part of a huge science experiment right now? Yes, very often. I think we have been for a while, but uh, the experiment was like on our bodies with all of the assaults with, you know, vaccines and GMO foods. Now they've expanded it um, to the whole planet. You know, I, it's pretty frightening. And, you know, I mean, for anyone who's who's listened to me um, for some of the other shows that I do, I frequently have gone off about this whole human animal hybrid you know, mixing up things in Petri dishes and uh, completely unfettered nanotechnology development, you know, super viruses, but printing, you know, how they made the super bird flu now, you know, in two um, science publications. It's complete insanity. So, um, you know, this core exit thing, uh, there had been rumors that uh, it was doing damage to uh, wildlife People were getting burns in the rain. Um, and then uh, quite recently, there was a story about uh, crustaceans in the Gulf whose arms and eyes were just crumbling and falling off. I mean, how horrifying is that? So there's definitely um, a, an experiment going on with this core exit. But I don't think that we know the full extent of it. So this article that Dr. Carley was reading... Um, kind of addresses that and, and brings up an interesting theory. And I don't know, there was quite a bit of proof behind it, too. So I'm going to be interested to see how this plays out. But go yeah, ahead. There's, I, I read the, it, the article is long, and it's called The Gulf Blue Plague. It's not wise to fool Mother Nature. Um, there are multiple sources here that have been cited, including patents for the, some of the technology that BP was using not only after the disaster, but prior to the pumping of that well, they injected a large amount of what was considered an experimental bacteria they had spliced with DNA that would allow it to replicate itself rapidly in a very um, dangerous environment. And they injected it into the ground to help put the oil under more pressure so it could be pumped up faster. And when they went to drill the well, they started noticing all these cracks and fissures around the well head. They pulled back, pulled out of that area, closed it off, went and dug. And this was, again, an experimental project. Went to drill in another area, and that's when the well blew up. So they had already started this experimental process, but the core exit that they used had never been tested in any type of um, environment that involved humans or animals. It had only been tested in a lab, and they released this on the public without doing any type of research about what effect it would have on people's health, on the animals in the Gulf. And what it would do once it got into the atmosphere. 
is this being blown around in the tropopause like the rads? And if it was already a recombinant type of DNA and bacteria, you know, it's not going to just replicate. It'll continually replicate itself. That's, that's how bacteria and viruses stay attached to their host is by constantly changing so the immune system can't fight them off properly. So now we have this stuff loose. Uh, one thing the I environment find... down there. And it's really, when you, this article was really something. In fact, we sent this article to all the hosts on Orion because I want as many people to promote this kind of research as possible. And, you know, we're finding out about this up here. The people that live down there really have no idea. They don't talk about this in the news at all. And I frequently sent articles to my friends that live in Tampa they, they don't talk about any of the, the animal deaths or the strange things that they're finding. And so much of the job industry down there is fishing, and it's, like, generational, too. Well, this article was written on October 24th of 2010, and it basically outlines what could possibly happen if this stuff got loose on the public. In theory, but it's actually happening or it could be happening now based on some of these strange cases. And, you know, they're going to be doing all kinds of toxicology and, and tissue analysis on these people. So hopefully, you know, that can take time, though. It can take a, a few months to get those results back. I didn't see any new cases come up. I did see there was another passenger that had to be restrained on a flight. A 24-year-old Canadian man who is now in federal custody for rushing the front of an American Airlines flight from Jamaica after the plane landed in Miami. This happened on the ground. He caused interference with the flight crew. Uh, FBI said it wasn't terrorism-related. He was not on a no-fly list, and it didn't provide any other information except saying that he was disoriented. But, boy, the stuff that's going on down in Florida right now, and that was our bug-out plan, <laughs> to go to Florida. Yeah, I wouldn't be going to Florida. You know, um... One thing that uh, I want to point out about that bacteria yeah. that BP has supposedly unleashed is that uh, in that article, they were calling it a new life form. Uh-huh. Kind of reminds me a little bit of um, Monsanto, you know, their new life form that they created, too, with the GMO. Yeah, definitely take a look at this article, Synthetic Genomics and microbial enhanced oil recovery the different patents in fact they have a few of them that are pending uh, it talks about the bp wells and this particular uh synthesis was called cynthia this new life form has the ability to replicate itself and organically function in any cell into which it has been introduced its dna is artificial and it's this synthetic DNA that takes control of the cell and is credited with being the building block of life. This is the first self-replicating synthetic bacterial cell thanks to its computer-generated DNA. The funding for this came from Synthetic Genomics Incorporated. The company BP has a sizable equity position and alliance with. BP is definitely way beyond petroleum, just as their new slogan publicizes. And doing so made this identifiable as a unique and patented privately owned asset. So they actually have a patent on this technology. And then how the decision was made in using it to help get rid of the oil is also discussed. So I'll drop this in the chat. I'll post it on Ratchet. Uh, there's also some information from a Scientific American in this article. And being part of the science experiment um, that we live in today also creates problems for growing food. And so we asked Drew Lamb to come back on Thursday to talk to us about aquaponics and anything new that he may have learned so we can tell people everything that they can possibly do to grow their food safely outdoors. So we will talk to him on Thursday. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Jules. Thank you. And we'll see you Thursday.